What's up guys, it's David, and today I'm giving you my top 20 movies of 2016. I know this video is coming a little late, but some movies that are released in limited release in December didn't come into my city until around mid-January, so I waited to do my list until I could see a few more movies. Also, sadly, there were still some movies that just are not gonna be playing in my area that I did not get to see before making this list, such as Manchester by the Sea, A Monster Calls, or Silence. But I still got to see a ton of movies this year, and this is my 20 favorite out of all the ones I saw. At number 20, I have Loving. This movie was directed by Jeff Nichols and focuses on an interracial couple who get married, and in Virginia, it is illegal for people of opposite color to marry. And their case goes all the way to the federal court, and they're basically the couple who made it legal for people of opposite color to get married. This is based on a true story. Joel Edgerton and Ruth Nega play the couple. They're both fantastic in this, and so is their chemistry. The thing I really loved about this movie that might turn a few people off is that it's very quiet. There are no big, emotional, swelling moments. There's nothing that really feels cinematic about it. It's almost as if you're just watching these people live their lives. And some people may find that boring, but I got completely enraptured in it. And even though there are no huge, sappy, emotional moments, that doesn't mean that I didn't get emotionally connected to both these characters and their story. At number 19, I have Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them. I'm a big fan of the Harry Potter franchise, but the trailers for this movie didn't really get me on board. But thankfully, when I saw the movie, it turned out great. Sometimes when you get a new installment in a beloved franchise, all you get is comparisons to the old one. For for example, when The Force Awakens came out and everyone was comparing the plot of The Force Awakens to Episode 4 and comparing Ray Poe and Finn to Han, Luke, and Leia, but you can't really do that with Fantastic Beasts because it feels really unique and original. It's even set in America where all the other Harry Potter movies are based out of England. All four of the main characters in this movie, not only do they feel different from the characters that you got in the original Harry Potter franchise, but you also grow to love them quickly. This movie was just a really fun adventure. It adds some super cool things to the Harry Potter canon while also giving you some bad story on characters you may already know. At number 18, I have Patriot's Day. This is the third team-up between director Peter Berg and actor Mark Wahlberg. I loved Lone Survivor. I thought Deepwater Horizon was pretty good, but I wasn't in love with it like some other people are, but I definitely loved Patriot's Day. This movie tells the story of the infamous Boston Marathon bombing that happened back in 2013, I think it was. This movie is heartbreaking and uplifting at the same time. Obviously, it's heartbreaking because you have the tragedy of this incident, and the movie really goes in depth in showing to you the effect this had on the victims, but it's also uplifting because you get to see how the city of Boston came together after this happened to help find the two guys involved and basically give a big middle finger to terrorism. The way this movie is shot feels very lifelike. It's almost like you're watching a documentary. I'd say this is definitely one of Wahlberg's career best performances. He had a lot of scenes that really just wowed me. All the supporting actors are great too. John Goodman, J.K. Simmons, Kevin Bacon. And I also like the way this movie portrayed the two terrorists who committed this crime. It gave you some insight to what they were doing and a little tiny bit into why they were doing it, but it didn't try to make us sympathetic for them and it didn't try to justify their actions at all. At number 17, I have The Nice Guys. This is definitely one of the most fun movies I've seen all year. This movie is set in the 70s in Los Angeles and you definitely get that Los Angeles feel when watching this movie. A lot of the sets and costumes reminded me of Boogie Nights and they're both set around the same time so that's definitely a positive. Russell Crowe and Ryan Gosling both give amazing hilarious performances especially Ryan Gosling. This was one of the funniest movies I've seen all year and he was definitely a big part of that. The little girl who plays his daughter I forget her name but I had never seen her before and she was amazing in this movie too. She was doing and saying things a 12 year old should never do but that's what it made it so funny. It has a fun original murder mystery type story. And although I do think maybe 10 or so minutes could have been cut out of this movie, it's still a blast and I love it. At number 16, I have Hell or High Water. Ben Foster and Chris Pine play two brothers who are robbing banks to pay back the mortgage on their farm. And we also follow Jeff Bridges and Gil Birmingham as two police officers who are trying to catch these guys. And I love the duality this movie portrays. We're cheering for the two brothers robbing these banks because you see where they're coming from and why they're doing it and they're both very likable characters. But you're also kind of rooting for the cops because the movie focuses a lot of time on them and you come to love both these characters and their relationship dynamic. So by the end of this movie, you see both sides and you really don't know who to root for and that makes it very interesting. This movie's set in Texas and you definitely feel that. There's some beautiful visuals here. Every performance in this movie is great. I love Chris Pine as Captain Kirk, but I'd say this is maybe the best performance he's ever given in his career. Ben Foster always gives amazing performances, but he doesn't have the best track record when it comes to choosing good movies. 
but this time we get a great Ben Foster performance but in a great movie which just makes it all the better and Jeff Bridges was an amazing supporting actor in this. I wouldn't be surprised if he got nominated for an Oscar. At number 15 I have 10 Cloverfield Lane. This movie came out of nowhere for me as it did for everyone else because they didn't even announce it until like three weeks before it came out. So I had basically no expectations going into this other than the fact that it had the Cloverfield name in the title and I was very pleasantly surprised with how this movie turned out. Mary Elizabeth Winstead plays a woman who awakens from a car crash and finds herself trapped in a survival bunker with John Goodman's character and John Gallagher Jr.'s character. And this movie all the way through is just an amazing thrill ride. The tension the director builds in this movie is immaculate. John Goodman's character is the one who has taken her captive, but you never really know if he's doing it to actually protect her or just because he's a crazy psycho. He was fantastic in this movie, absolutely creepy, but you also still think that maybe he is a good guy, you just don't know, which just adds to the tension of it all. I love the set design and I love the way the camera angles were set up so that it still feels like a really small, compact place, but also the visuals don't get repetitive or anything. This movie may have been a few spots higher, but the ending kind of sours it a little. Not that I don't like the ending, I actually really loved the direction it went. I just don't think the execution was quite there. There's just like a five minute section during the ending where a character makes decisions and acts in a way that based on her character, it just doesn't seem realistic with what has already been built. But regardless, it's a fantastic movie. At number 14, I have The Edge of 17. I did not expect this movie to be as good as it was. Haley Steinfeld gives her best performance maybe ever. It's hard to say because she was so good in True Grit, but I'd say it definitely at least equals that performance. She plays Nadine, who's a socially awkward high school student who really only has one friend and when her friend starts dating her brother basically she just thinks that her whole world is over. This movie was hilarious but it also has a lot of heart and I love the way it portrays the teenage attitude because you know how a lot of teenagers are. One thing happens to them and they feel like the world is burning. The plot may get a little predictable at times but that's not what its movie's about. The plot services the amazing characters this movie introduces. Woody Harrelson is a fantastic supporting actor in this as Nadine's teacher who she always goes to to whine and bitch to and a lot of the scenes they have together are some of the funniest in the movie. At number 13 I have Hacksaw Rouge. This is Mel Gibson's directorial comeback. It's the first movie he's directed since Apocalypto and he proves that he still has it with this one. Love him or hate him as a human being you cannot deny the talent this man has when it comes to directing and acting. The first half of this movie is a little paint by numbers but it makes up for it with great characters and of course Andrew Garfield giving an amazing performance as the lead role here but also building on the interesting premise of this guy who wants to go the, to war but doesn't actually want to use weapons to fight, which is crazy enough just watching it, but then you think about how this is based on a true story and that a guy actually did this and it makes it that much crazier. But where this movie really shines is in the second half of the movie, where it's just balls to the wall, gruesome, gritty warfare, and the way Mel Gibson directs the action in this movie is phenomenal. This is the most realistic war action I've seen since Saving Private Ryan, and it may even be better, I don't know, I'd have to watch it again, but it's fantastic regardless. But it's not just all action, you get a lot of really great character moments within all this action, and having built on the characters in the first part of the movie made the second half all that more impactful. This is one of the best directed movies of the year, and Andrew Garfield gives a career best performance. Like I said, I haven't seen Silence yet, so maybe he's better than that, I don't know. But I definitely wouldn't mind if he got an Oscar nomination for his role in Hacksaw Ridge. At number 12, I have Green Room. This is Jeremy Saunier's second film. I loved his first movie, Blue Rune, so I was super excited to check out Green Room. This movie is about a punk band who go to a neo-Nazi club to perform, and from there, shit just goes down. The first 20 minutes or so is just setting up these characters and the bar that they're in. But once shit starts happening, this movie is balls to the walls insane. This movie has its foot on the gas and it does not let go until the very end. This movie doesn't have plot twists or anything like that. You're just watching this band and wondering how the hell they're going to get out of this situation. And the great thing about this movie is that it's not just thrilling and entertaining the first time you watch it. You can watch it as many times as you want and it's still fun as hell. The whole cast is great. None of them really have big moments to shine. But for the small parts they play, they play them excellently. And rest in peace to Anton Yelchin, that guy was such a great talent and we lost him way too soon. At number 11, I have Midnight Special. This is the second movie from Jeff Nichols on my list. This time it's about a father and his son who has weird supernatural powers. 
and they're on the road with the father's friend trying to escape people who are trying to find this boy. Once again, this movie is just a really fresh original idea. And that's always fun to watch because you never really know where the movie is going and what exactly is happening with this boy and where he gets his powers. Michael Shannon does a fantastic job as the father, but when is Michael Shannon not amazing in a movie? Adam Driver is great as this scientist who works for the government but may not agree with how they're trying to handle this boy. The visuals in this movie are beautiful, the writing is great, and it's kind of sad because this movie went under the radar and I don't think that many people got a chance to check it out. So I think everyone should go watch this movie because it's really awesome. Starting off my top 10, I have Hunt for the Wilder People directed by Taika Waititi, who also did What We Do in the Shadows back in 2015, which was a hilarious mockumentary about vampires. This movie follows Ricky, who's a troubled foster kid and gets put into foster care with a couple he calls Aunt Bella and Uncle Heck. When Aunt Bella passes away, Heck and Ricky get thrown on this crazy adventure, going through the bush of New Zealand, trying to escape the foster care people who are trying to take Ricky and put him back into foster care. This is a really funny movie. There's a lot of really great, quirky, funny moments it's that kind of remind me of Wes Anderson's style of humor. The cinematography by Lachlan Milne is excellent. Sam Neill plays Uncle Heck, and he gives his best performance since Jurassic Park. And the reluctant relationship between him and Ricky, it's fun to see that grow. I love this movie's quirky humor, it's a great adventure, and it's also very heartfelt. At number 9, I have Nocturnal Animals. You may know Tom Ford is a very successful fashion designer, but he has proved with this movie and 2009's A Single Man that he is also a great director. This movie is about a woman played by Amy Adam who receives a book from her ex-husband and as she reads the book she begins to see the parallels between stuff that happens in the novel and stuff that happened in their relationship. This movie has a very unique story structure because it switches back and forth between the present day with Amy Adams, the fictional stuff in the novel she's reading, and flashback stuff where it shows her relationship with her ex-husband played by Jake Gyllenhaal. Not only does this way of telling the story make for a really cool, different experience, but it also really helps open so many doors thematically. It's been over a month since I've seen this movie and I still find myself thinking about it all the time. Just reminiscing about it, I have these oh shit moments where I realize something new about the movie. The way that certain things that happen in the novel connect to her real life is brilliantly done. The performances by everyone in this movie are some of the best I've seen all year. Michael Shannon and Aaron Taylor Johnson have already been getting a ton of buzz when it comes to award nominations, and they definitely deserve it. They were both amazing in their own respective ways, but one person who I'm really surprised hasn't been getting more buzz is Jake Gyllenhaal. Gyllenhaal usually always gives a great performance, but he had so many scenes in this movie that really just blew me away with what he was doing. Amy Adams is great too, and I hope that at least one of these guys gets nominated when it comes to Oscar season. From what I've seen, the ending of this movie is very divisive, and I can completely understand why, because when I saw this movie, as it was coming to an end, I could tell, and I was just hoping. I was like, please don't end it here, please don't end it here, and they did. And I was actually kind of angry walking out of the theater because I did not like it at all. But all that day, I kept thinking about it and thinking about it, and when it finally clicked in my brain why they would end it like that, I can't see them having it ended any other way. It was done perfectly. This movie was brilliant brilliantly directed, brilliantly shot, brilliantly acted, brilliantly edited. The fact that this is only my number 9 shows you just how good of a year we had for movies. At number 8, I have the directorial debut from Robert Eggers, The Witch. When it comes to horror movies, they just don't scare me. I'm not just saying that to act tough or anything, it's just that I can separate fiction from reality in my brain. Movies people love for being some of the scariest of all time, like The Exorcist, The Conjuring, or The Shining. I just love for how great the filmmaking is. But for some reason, for the first time ever, The Witch truly scared me. Which I find kind of funny, because I've seen a lot of people say that they just found this movie boring and they don't understand how it's scary at all. But honestly, that's probably just because there's no jump scares, and there's nothing wrong with jump scares as long as they're used right. It's just that'll maybe scare you for like one or two seconds, and then it's gone. I think The Witch got to me because it's more psychological. The terror slowly seeped into me as the movie progressed, and by the end of it, I was pretty much scared shitless. Not the type of scared where I'm jumping every second, but I just have this really horrible feeling in my stomach the whole time I'm watching it. Or what I thought this movie did so brilliantly is that within the first 10 minutes of the movie, it establishes the existence of this witch, shows that she's out here snatching babies and killing them and making them into weird skin lotion. And then for a good chunk of the movie, she's not in it until about halfway through. Then after that, it completely takes her out again until the very ending. I think maybe that's another reason people found it boring, but to me, just knowing that the witch was out there was way scarier than her like hunting down people or doing any of that typical shit. 
This movie is also kind of a family drama, just seeing what this witch is doing to the family, how it tears them apart and pits them against each other. All as I was watching this movie, waiting for the witch to come back, I was just getting more and more tense. By the end, it got to the point when every time a shot would change, my stomach would churn because I had no idea where or when the witch would come. I don't know if it's intentional, but the way the shots are set up, there was always something I felt the witch could have been hiding behind or that she would just pop into the frame in the background or something. The performances in this movie were also great. This was the first time I had ever seen Anya Taylor-Joy in the movie and she really impressed me. Kate Dickey plays her mother. You may know her as Lyra from Game of Thrones. In this, she's as creepy and batshit crazy as she was in that show. And Ralph Innocent does a great job playing the father. He was also in Game of Thrones. He wasn't a major part but you might recognize him from it anyways. He was kind of the middleman in this whole movie. He was caught in the middle of everyone in the family at each other's throats, and he was kind of just trying to be the guy to make them all calm and love each other. This movie definitely won't be for everyone. If you just like horror movies because you like watching creepy monsters or jump scares or blood and gore and that type of stuff, I don't think you'll enjoy this movie. But if you're looking for more psychological horror, I think this will definitely be a movie for you. And Robert Eggers just did a great job directing this thing. Whatever he does next, I'll be first in line to watch it. At number seven, I have Swiss Army Man, or as some people call it, the Farting Corpse movie. I'm just gonna say right off the bat, this movie is not for everyone, not even in the slightest. What I'd recommend before watching this movie is go watch the trailer and see how you feel about that. If you hate the trailer, there's no way in hell you're gonna like this movie if you think it's just weird or stupid or something. But if the trailer looks like something you'd like, then go ahead and watch it. But even in that case, I can't guarantee you'll love it because the movie is 10 times more crazy and weird than the trailer is. And for me personally, I absolutely love this movie. Paul Dano plays a man who's stranded on an island and he's about to kill himself when he sees a corpse wash up on shore. And he soon figures out that this corpse is not normal at all. He can talk and he can perform all sorts of useful actions. He's a multi-tooled corpse, hence the title, Swiss Army Man. What I love most about this movie is as far out there and as wacky as it gets. It's also a really deep movie. The themes this movie displays and the things they use as metaphors to display them honestly just made my jaw drop with how people even came up with this and actually made it a movie. But as deep and serious as it gets by the end of the movie, this is still a really funny movie as well. Paul Dano and Daniel Radcliffe both give incredible performances. This may be Daniel Radcliffe's career best, which is weird to say because he's literally playing a dead man, but if you see the movie, I think you'll know what I'm saying. Him and Dano's chemistry is incredible in this, and it's the anchor of the whole movie. The set design, the cinematography, they all come together to add to this movie's really weird, unique tone. The way the score is done in this movie is something I've never really heard before, and it's also catchy as hell. Like I said, this is a movie that is definitely not for everybody, but if this is a movie that is up your alley, I think you'll absolutely love it. At number six, I have Sing Street. It's directed by John Carney, so you know it's gonna be about musicians. This movie in particular is about a kid named Connor who starts a band to impress this girl named Rafina who he has a crush on. At first he just wants a band to impress her and have a reason to talk to her, but then it turns out that the band he gets together actually makes really good music. This is one of those movies that after you're done watching it just gives you such a great feeling. It just makes you feel so good. It's the type of feeling you get after watching a movie like Rocky or A New Hope. This is the type of movie that I can't see anybody watching and not liking. Honestly, if you don't like this movie, I feel like you probably just don't have a heart. All the kids in this movie, I've never heard of any of these actors before, but they all do a great job. Jack Rayner does a really good job as Connor's older brother, Brendan, and their relationship is another core part of the movie. Brendan is really into music and he helps Connor discover his style and what he wants the sound of his band to be. And also they just have a really good brotherly relationship because their parents are kind of in the middle of getting separated. So they gotta stick together. Also the music in this movie is legitimately good. After I watched it, I went and got the soundtrack. And if none of this is enough to sell you on this movie, you get to see Littlefinger from Game of Thrones getting down on the dance floor, which as a Game of Thrones fan was kind of awesome and hilarious. Getting into my top five now, this is the point where I really had a hard time ordering these movies. I was confident with what my number one was, but five through two, really these could be in any order. But anyways, at number five, I have Moonlight. This movie blew me away on so many levels. First of all, the cast, I think this is easily the best ensemble cast of the year. Not only does everyone give a solid performance, but I think everyone in this movie who's a main player gives incredible performances. Mahershala Ali, Ashton Sanders, Naomi Harris, Janelle Monae, Trevante Rose, these guys all give the performance of a lifetime. This movie focuses on a boy named Chiron and it's done in three parts. 
One when he's a younger kid, one when he's a teenager, and one when he's an adult. And really this movie is about identity and how this boy finds himself growing up in a place where what he eventually discovers about himself and who he is doesn't really fly with where he grows up. Most of the time when I'm at the theater, as soon as the credits roll, I just try to get out of there as quick as I can. But when this movie ended, I just sat there for a good five minutes just watching the credits, trying to process how this movie made me feel. I had never seen a Barry Jenkins film before this, but wow, did he do an amazing job with this movie. Trying to show 20 years of someone's life within two hours and have you feel like you know that person and understand what they're going through and what they're struggling with. And also making this all feel like a concise movie with a start and finish. There's a lot of things he had to juggle with this movie. It was no easy task doing what he did. But the way he pulled it off, I mean, this is the type of movie that's just so good. Every time I think about it, I really just wish I owned the Blu-ray already so I could just go watch it. The cinematography in this movie is incredible as well. I really hope James Laxton gets an Oscar nomination for his work on this movie. There's just so much to talk about with this movie. I could talk about it for hours. I really feel like I haven't said enough, but if you haven't seen this movie, please go watch it. It's incredible. At number four, I have Arrival. I think it's safe to say by now that Denis Villeneuve is easily one of the best directors working today. Since Incendies, this man has not made a bad film. In fact, I'd argue that they're all at least great. And Arrival is no exception. This movie focuses on Amy Adams, who's a language professor, and she's brought in when these weird spaceships land on Earth. And the government needs her help to try to communicate with these aliens to find out why they're here and what they want. Don't go into this movie expecting Independence Day or something, because it's not even close to that. This is not a big blockbuster action sci-fi movie. This is more of a thinking sci-fi movie. It puts the science in science fiction if you know what I mean. Seeing how Amy Adams' character slowly figures out how to communicate with these aliens is really riveting. I love in movies like this when they can take fictional things and make the science behind them seem realistic. At the end, there's a revelation that makes you rethink the entire movie, and honestly, that blew my mind. I'm not gonna spoil it, but if I could, there's just so much to say about it. Not only is it a cool twist, but it makes you rethink the entire movie, and also adds a whole new thematic layer. This isn't just some cheap M. Night Shyamalan plot twist, it actually adds to the movie as a whole. And honestly, it made me shed a few tears. I don't think I can ever say there's been a plot twist that has made me feel so emotional. But yeah, what an amazing, unique, smart science fiction movie. The writing is incredible. Amy Adams probably deserves an Oscar nomination. The cinematography by Bradford Young is stunning. I would not be surprised if he won an Oscar for it. And Denis Villeneuve, I mean, this man is just a genius. I can't wait to see what he does with Blade Runner. At number three, I have The Lobster, directed by Yorgos Lanthimos. I think this may be the second weirdest movie I've seen all year behind Swiss Army Man. So once again, I think this is definitely not for everybody. In this movie, it's a dystopian future where basically if you're not in a relationship, you get sent to this hotel where in, within 45 days you need to find a partner or else you get transformed into an animal. If you hear that synopsis and go, what the hell, then maybe you shouldn't watch this. But if you're like me and to hear that and just get really interested, definitely give this movie a shot. Everything about this movie is just so bizarre and unique in the greatest way possible. The way all the actors perform and speak in such a melancholic way is really bizarre and weird, but somehow it works perfectly. And this movie has an amazing cast who all do a great job. You got Colin Farrell as the lead here, John C. Riley, Ben Wishaw, Rachel Weiss, Leia Sidu, Ariane Labed, and it's a Yorgos Lanthimos movie, so of course Angeliki Papulia is in it. With the near Nani mode of acting, the way the shots are set up, and the way this movie is paced, the movie isolates you as a viewer while still keeping you fully engaged at the same time. From the beginning to the end, you have no idea where the story is gonna go. I know a lot of people, like I was talking to my uncle the other day, and he said that he watched it and he loved the first half, but didn't like the second half, and I've seen a lot of people saying that, but personally, I loved it all. This movie also has a really high replay value for me. I think I've watched it like 11 or 12 times by now, so it's definitely my most watched movie of the year. And yeah, between Alps, Dogtooth, and this movie, I'm becoming a really big fan of Yorgos Lanthimos, and I can't wait to see what he does next. At number two, I have Rogue One, A Star Wars Story. As a massive Star Wars fan, I knew before even seeing this that it would end up on my list. And thankfully, the movie was amazing enough that it could end up this high on my list. And honestly, when I first saw it, I didn't think anything else would beat it. I thought it would be my number one. Obviously, that changed, and I'll talk about what beat it in a second. But Rogue One, man, there's just so much greatness in here. First of all, just as a huge Star Wars fan, all the cool Easter eggs and references to the original trilogy, that alone just made this movie so fun for me to watch. And there's a certain scene with Darth Vader that I think you know what I'm talking about, but I mean, that every time I've seen this movie, I, that part just makes me go crazy. But not only did this movie work for me as a Star Wars fan, but it hit me as a film lover too. 
The sets and the makeup and costume design are all breathtaking. For a two hour movie that's just introducing us to these characters for the first time, I love how rich the characters were. Not only that, but they were all unique and didn't feel like any other characters we've met previously in the Star Wars universe. The tone and atmosphere of this movie is a lot more gritty and dark than other Star Wars movies. A lot of the action scenes feel very warlike and realistic or as realistic as Star Wars can get. The visuals are beautiful. Basically what I'm trying to say is this movie can make me freak out as a big Star Wars nerd, but I can also really appreciate it as just a fan of film. But really, when it comes to my number one, when I saw this movie, I knew there was no way in hell that it wouldn't be my number one of the year, and that's La La Land. I don't even know where to start with this one. Really, I'd need like a 15 hour video to even get out all the reasons why this movie's amazing. I guess I'll start by saying it's about Mia, played by Emma Stone, who's an aspiring actress. But so far things aren't really going well for her whenever she goes into an audition people just don't really pay her attention or are interrupting her and sebastian played by ryan gosling is an aspiring jazz musician and pianist and just like her right now he's kind of down on his luck and things just aren't going his way and these two people meet and fall in love and their relationship is the core of this movie Right off the bat, Emma Stone and Ryan Gosling's chemistry is off the charts incredible. These guys are so convincing, I'm honestly surprised that they're not actually dating in real life. This movie is a musical, and just like a lot of people, I'm not really into musicals most of the time. Obviously, there are movies like Singing in the Rain that I still love, but a lot of the times, whenever the musical numbers break out, it just feels very unnatural, completely takes me out of the movie, and I just don't enjoy them. But with La La Land, every musical number feels not only natural, but needed. Also, a lot of times with musicals, I find the songs themselves very stale, but I completely love the La La Land soundtrack. For the past month since I've seen the movie, I've listened to that soundtrack a hundred times. A lot of people say that there's a big chunk in the middle of this movie where it forgets to be a musical, but I thought that was completely necessary because there's no point in that section where I felt it would have been natural for them to just break into song and dance. And then when we do get the next musical number, it's put in at the exact right place. Tom Cross, who won the Oscar for his editing on Whiplash, does an incredible job here as well. Lena Sandgren, who shot this movie, made it look absolutely gorgeous. And in making this movie look gorgeous, he certainly had a lot of help from incredible costume design, incredible set design. All the beautiful colors and textures just make this an incredible movie just visually. I think Damien Chazelle better win the Oscar for Best Director because some of these scenes, the directing is just perfect. I mean, that opening dance scene on the highway alone, to get that exactly right, must have taken a ton of work. And I think really only a man as talented as Damien Chazelle could have pulled that off. And coming back to Mia and Sebastian, seeing their relationship blossom, but also how they have to balance careers with their love life. It's realistic, this movie isn't all sunshine and rainbows. Some people might not like the ending, and on paper, I don't think I would either. Without seeing the movie, if I just heard what the ending was gonna be, I'd say out of the million ways you could have executed the ending, maybe one of those ways would have worked. But the way it ended up being executed worked absolutely perfect. I don't think you could have ended this movie any other way, and overall, I feel confident in saying that this is my favorite movie of 2016. So those were my top 20 movies of 2016. I'm sure you guys have vastly different lists from me, so leave your list down in the comment section below. And thank you guys, as always, for watching, and I'll see you next time.